Hello, thank you all for having me. First of all, I'm just going to say that this won't be a very politically correct talk. I'm going to wave plastic penises around and penis pumps and things. So if you're feeling a bit fragile, then I don't know, blank your screen or something. Um, this orange strip at the top of this slide is probably my proudest moment in my career. It was about five years ago, I was asked to go and do a talk to a big group of farmers out in the Midwest. And when I saw the advertisement they put out, they had this warning at the end of their day. They had a study day all on um, farm stuff. And then they had me as the last speaker of the day and it came with a warning. And I thought, well, I've really made it. Now I come with a warning. I'm so incorrect. So anyway, and I just think that's a really cute slide. I think, you know, it's hard these days to have honest conversations because we all have to be so careful about what we say. So this is a safe place. And if you have a question that you want to ask that you think might not be appropriate, nothing is inappropriate as far as I'm concerned. So don't feel that way at all. And I see lots of people with all different sorts of sexual health problems, but a lot of what I see are prostate cancer, bladder cancer, and people who have had, like women who have had gynecological cancers, because basically any kind of treatment that goes on in your pelvis has the ability to affect your intimacy and your ability to have good sexual function. So I just think this is a cute cartoon as well. I think often if we don't understand what our partner has gone through and how that might affect their physical function, we suddenly think that they don't love us anymore, they don't find us attractive, all these sorts of things. So communication is the best thing that you can do to improve your intimate life and um, just making sure you keep everyone in the loop and explain to them what's going on. So do people with cancer actually care about their sexuality? And yes, they do. So there's lots of research about this, but one study showed that 80% of participants with cancer had an intense interest to discuss these concerns. The problem is, is they didn't feel like they could ask their health professional about it because they often feel guilty that, you know, they've been cured of cancer and they're not going to die anymore. So maybe that's all they should expect. And I think that's really sad because we are getting really good at fixing people's diseases and illnesses nowadays. And we have to think about if we're going to let someone live for another 30 or 40 years longer, that's a long time to live without parts of your body working, whichever part it may be. So I think it is really important and I really encourage all of you to ask your health professional because often they're sitting there going, I hope they don't ask me because they're embarrassed. So I won't ask them, I might embarrass them and vice versa. So someone needs to bring up the subject and you are entitled to have an intimate life. It's not okay just to think I've got over cancer treatment and now I just have to suck it up and be grateful. So why is sex and intimacy important? They're important for your quality of life, your relationships, your mental health and your physical health. And the World Health Organization actually list on their sexual well-being in the same importance as food, water and shelter. So I think if it's good enough for the World Health Organization, it's good enough for us to think that it's important. So I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be the same, but it doesn't mean that it can't be good because it certainly can be. And as we'll find out, I've actually seen quite a lot of couples or single people who have gone on to say that their intimate and sexual lives are actually better after they've had a cancer diagnosis and treatment because it's the first time in many years they've had to actually think about what's going on and find new ways to do things. So I think the other important thing is to note that having sexual dysfunction is really common in life in general. So, you know, nearly half of the population will have some sort of sexual issue in their lifetime, 90% of depressed people. And conversely, if you've got a sexual dysfunction, you often end up depressed. And there's a large discrepancy in the statistics following prostate cancer surgery, but also bladder cancer surgery and all surgeries. And you have to remember that research is always about five or more years behind what's actually published. So what we see in practice and what you will read, you know, when you Google this are going to be two different things. So try not to be too sad about what you read. And I think a good example of that is that if you look at the statistics, it says 29 to 60% of men that have prostate cancer surgery will regain function. 
But in my clinic, about 70% do now. And when I first started working with prostate cancer patients about eight and a half years ago, there was only about 40%. So things are improving all the time. Treatments are improving and, and cures for the problems that the treatments cause are improving. So it's never too late to ask questions and find out. So what's the most consistent predictor of sexual health in cancer survivors? It's the person's emotional well-being and how they're feeling about life in general and, and what their mental health is like and the quality of the partnered relationship. And that comes back to what we were talking about before, that the biggest aphrodisiac and the biggest thing that's going to fix your intimate life is communication. So having a good partner and having people you can talk to about this is really, really important. And whether or not your partner has sexual dysfunction, you know, so often I'll meet a lady who's just had gone through breast cancer treatment and her husband will also have been diagnosed with prostate cancer or someone, you know, like that. They often go hand in hand because we're often aging at the same rate and all these problems prop up. So what intimacy is not is the dance of two good looking bodies. It is a way to connect yourself with someone else. And I think most importantly with this is I think that we think of sex as penetrative sex and, you know, whether or not you're in a same-sex relationship or you're in a heterosexual relationship, we often think of, of sex as something that involves penetration. Well, it isn't. Sex is everything that is about getting close to another person, sharing physical sensations and intimacy and celebrating pleasure and expressing love with someone else. So this cartoon, I actually got this drawn. This is one of my patients and he told me this after he had bladder cancer, actually, that he felt like an old FJ Holden. His exhaust was leaking, he'd blown a headlight and his horn didn't work anymore. And I just thought that pretty much explains most of the men that I see in my clinic. Um, I think this is not just for women because we know that many men that go through um, search cancer treatments, particularly prostate cancer treatment, but they will have hormone like medication that lower their testosterone levels and they feel like a menopausal woman. And that can be really, you know, awful from the, not just from a sexual function point of view, but from the fact that you get hot flushes. If you're, if you're a guy, you might grow breasts. If you're a woman, you're, you know, or a man, you'll feel grumpy and tired and miserable. So, you know, all of these different medical treatments that are great because they're saving people's lives are causing other side effects that we need to address. So the most important part of your whole intimate life is your brain. So if everything else isn't working down there and your brain's working, you're 90% there. So we really need to, to think about it's a lot of it. And I'm not saying that you can will yourself to have good function, but you can certainly will yourself to have a nice time and experience pleasure in a different way. I think it's important to think about men and women and we always think that men and women are really different but they're not as different as we think so if you're looking at this screen on a computer it'll be on your left hand side is a penis the bigger one is the penis and on the right hand side is the clitoris and as you'll see they're actually really similar and when an embryo is formed in utero they all start off the same it's the same cells and it's just that a penis grows outside the body and the clitoris stays hidden inside the body. And I think it does help to think that we're actually more similar than we realise. And I think, you know, there's it's a common thing that we go, oh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. But in my experience and having spent a lot of time with men and women one-on-one, -on -one, I actually think we're a lot more similar than we realise. And uh, just out of interest sake, this is a clitoris. So when you look at a clitoris, most people would only think of that tiny little bit there, and I hope you can see that on the nub. Can you see that? So just this little nub here, that's the bit we see on the outside, and all the rest of it is inside. So a clitoris is actually quite large. This is the actual size of one, um, but we don't know that because we only see a little bit on the outside. We're just a little bit more discreet than the guys. And then this is Jeffrey. So the other interesting thing is both of these organs have to have erections when we're sleeping to keep them healthy. So they both have erectile tissue in them. The only difference is this one's Jeffrey. That's my penis's name. He um, pokes you in the back when he's getting his exercise at nighttime and Veronica, the, the clitoris, doesn't do that. So 
but we're actually very similar. The other thing that's interesting about men and women is our arousal curve. And I saw a couple for some counselling today exactly in this situation. So men and women have the same arousal curve, but if you can see the red line, that's a guy. So a guy goes from arousal to orgasm. They can do very easily in 10 minutes. The average for most women is 25 minutes. And so you can see straight away that there's going to be an issue there if, you know, you're trying, if you've got a partner who's female and you're a guy and you're ready to go in 10 minutes and she needs 25 minutes. So that is a big thing. I think when men understand that, that then they can spend more time going, okay, maybe before we get really hot and heavy, I'll give you a massage because that would be erotic and you'd get to you know, you would get turned on by touching and the skin and the sensation. And for her, it gives her some time to think about it and, and for her body to become prepared. This is a really old photo, which I think has been used by every sexologist at some stage, um, usually to say that men get turned on by turning on a switch and women are much more complicated. Uh, I actually totally disagree with this. I think all the time that I've spent with men in the last few years, I think men are much more complicated than this and that as a society, we oversimplify it. And I, in my experience, most men don't come in and tell me they're upset about their sexual function going downhill because they want an erection and they just want to have an orgasm. Most of them feel really sad about it because they feel like they've lost their masculinity and they've lost their connection to a partner and they're lonely. So. For any women that are listening, I think men are more complicated and I think that this whole intimacy thing for men is a lot more emotional than we often give them credit for. Um, so I think there should be a heap more knobs on the top half of this. So women, what are women turned on by? They're turned on by being wooed, talking, dancing, ironing and cleaning. Now, not the woman. Like, I don't get turned on if I'm vacuuming and washing clothes. But it is a turn on if my husband did it. So, um, but in all seriousness, if your partner has, is female and she's ever said to you, if you helped around the house more, then I would feel more inclined to be intimate with you. It's not them just telling you that. It's because often on a, in a woman's mind, there's all these other things to do and intimacy is the last thing on our mind. So if you can help by doing some of these things for them and taking it off their mind, they're much more likely for that to then have space to be at the forefront. So it really does make a difference. And if you really don't want to do it yourself, get a cleaning lady so none of you have to do it or a cleaning man or a cleaning person. I told you I'm not very um, politically correct. Um, hugging, touching and kissing. You know, for women, this, this being tactile and spending quality time with your partner is really important for both men and women. Having fun together is important. So, you know, I think often when couples come to see me, I think they think I'm going to tell them that they have to swing from the chandeliers and do things in all these strange positions. Usually I'm telling them, when was when you were dating, when you were courting, what did you used to do together that was fun? And you'll, if you think back to that, and it might be five years ago, it might be 40 years ago, you would have made an effort with your partner. You would have thought of special things they might like to do and it might be going temping bowling or hiking or fishing or whatever it is. It's having experiences with another person is one of the most, the best things to do for your intimate life because when you're laughing together and you're having fun together, you're much more likely to then want to be intimate. Um, the reason I've got erotica down the bottom for women is a lot of women don't get turned on by visual, whereas men are more visual. So for men, looking at pictures of naked things that turn them on is really often arousing. For women, reading erotica is much better for most women, and that's not for everybody. But when you read erotica, it's not so in your face, and then your imagination can go. So if I see women that have a low libido and they like they say, I just don't even think about sex, it's not even coming into my mind, I'll often suggest that they read erotica. Now, you don't want to be on the bus on your way to work with a book with some kind of saucy-looking picture on the front. So get a Kindle um, and read that because no one knows what you're reading. The other thing that is really important for your intimate life is changing the script. So 
you wouldn't always eat vanilla ice cream every day for the next 40 years. So change things up. And that's when I think when you've had any sort of illness or cancer treatment that's affected your intimacy, it can be a really good opportunity to go, well, we've never tried this before and what we've always done doesn't work anymore. So let's try something new. And I honestly can say that at least once a week, I will see a couple that will say to me, you know what, after our cancer treatment and we're a year or two down the track, our sex life is better than it was for the five years before. And that's because number one, they it wasn't just on tap anymore. So they actually, they were worried about losing it. So they worked at it. They communicated about it. And often, you know, the first time a couple has had a conversation ever about what, what their intimate life is, is when they're sitting in the room with me and their surgeon who's about to do something that's going to affect their function has sent them along for a chat. And they'll both often learn things that they didn't know about each other or things that they'd like to try or and you know a lot of couples I meet have never even thought about buying a sex toy and this is an opportunity to try something new which we all know that trying anything new is exciting getting a new car is exciting going to a new place is exciting so trying something new can be good uh, a lot of I just thought we would talk a little bit about orgasms so I think the same as I said before that having an erection is it shouldn't be the be all and end all and there's so many other things we can do other than worrying about penetrative sex. But And having an orgasm shouldn't be the be all and end all and it shouldn't be the aim of intimacy. The aim of intimacy should just be to spend quality one-on-one -on -one time with your partner and enjoy each other and, and be in each other's presence and focus on them. But obviously orgasms are nice. Um, and they are actually really healthy for you. Like when you when you have an orgasm, we release endorphins and oxytocin and all of these hormones in our body that we get that are actually antidepressants. So if you feel a lot better after you've had an orgasm, it's not just because it's in your mind. You genuinely do feel better because your body, it's like your body's natural antidepressant. So we often don't hear much about female orgasms. And I mean, it's pretty obvious when a guy has an orgasm, unless of course he's had his prostate removed like you do with bladder cancer treatment or with um, prostate cancer because there's no ejaculate. But for women, it's hard to know whether or not it's happened. And it's actually often more difficult for a woman to have an orgasm. And I think it's interesting to know just these basic things about it. So five to 10% of women have never had an orgasm with a partner and 15 to 20 percent can only have one alone and of 80 percent of women that have had an orgasm they've never they haven't had it with pen only half of them have it with penetration so as a basic rule of thumb about one in 20 women and it's the same all stats are different but will have an orgasm from penetration alone most women need clitoral stimulation so i think if you're the partner of a woman who doesn't have have an orgasm with penetration it's not anything you're doing wrong it's just the anatomy of that woman and I think it's it's good to know that um, some lucky women can have an orgasm even through nipple stimulation but not through penetration so I think that goes back to changing the script like I really encourage you to try new things um, and female ejaculation does occur not quite like you said in porn but it is possible it's unknown how much, and usually in porn, it looks like a lot. That's not true. It's just a small amount. Anorgasmia can happen for men and women. For medications can often cause this. Treatments can cause this. Um, age can cause it. Stress can cause it. Relationship dysfunction can cause it. All sorts of things. So we need to like sit down with people when this has been a problem. And it's particularly if they've never had an issue before and then something has changed and try and get to the bottom of why they've developed this issue. The treatments for it are cognitive behavioural therapy, Sensate Focus, which um, I encourage you to all to look up. If you just Google the word Sensate Focus, it's a really lovely technique where one partner lays down and the other part and usually closes their eyes and the other partner explores their body really gently and touches all these different places on their body, like not just their genitals, like starting at the head and working all the way down and figuring out which bits feel particularly sensitive and what feels nice. 
And it's a great way of slowing things down. So with that arousal curve I talked about earlier, um, that is a great way to slow things down. So we get that 25 minutes of build up for the woman. Um, but it's also a really good way to find out if after you've had cancer treatment or just as you've got older and your function has changed, there might be places on your body that you never knew were essential before or that have suddenly become sensual and they weren't earlier because of the changes in your body. So I think Sensate Focus is a really great thing and there's a lot of information about it on the web and there's some really good books about it as well. Um, Airwave sex toys are great and I'm going to talk a little bit more about sex toys in a minute so I'll mention that. And pelvic floor exercises. So everyone, man or woman, should be doing regular pelvic floor exercises. The stronger your pelvic floor, because your pelvic floor contracts when you have an orgasm. So the stronger and the more intense your pelvic floor, the more intense your orgasm. So I've seen a lot of men and women that when I've like seen them and they've been having problems with orgasm, it's usually, you know, later in age, it's just, just as much as getting them to go and see a pelvic floor physio and getting their pelvic floor to be firmed up makes a massive difference to their response. I think the other thing is masturbation. So I think it's in a lot of, it depends how old you are. And I think the younger generations aren't quite so taboo about this and they talk more freely than probably anyone over the age of 40 and onwards. But, you know, it did used to be one of those things that you did at home and no one ever talked about. But it's actually a really good thing. I mean, as I said to you before, having an orgasm is good for your physical health. Um, it helps improve your immune function. It's mood boosting and it's good whenever you have an orgasm, you're exercising your pelvic floor. You can do it alone or you can do it with a partner. And, you know, when two partners are either like, stimulating each other or themselves and they're together I call that um, outer course so intercourse is penetration and outer course is that and I think that's a really great thing to do with a partner particularly when one person has had some sort of pelvic treatment and they might have pain because that you can then still experience intimacy and pleasure together but nobody is having to worry about pain or feeling nervous the other great thing about masturbation is it's safe um, you can't get an STI and you can't get pregnant. It relieves pain. Having orgasms is a very good pain relief. And it's great for mismatched libidos. You know, so that's another thing that I commonly see is couples where one of them would like to have sex four times a week and the other would like it once a month. Well, how do you, you negotiate that? And I always think it's really sad that usually the person in a relationship with the lowest libido kind of rules the roost there. And the other person spends their time chasing and one person spends their time distancing. And then the, the person who wants it more often feels rejected. So I think, you know, sitting down with your partner and having a conversation about what you would like in an ideal world and making a compromise is a really good thing. And then the person who, who has the higher libido shouldn't be made to feel guilty and should feel comfortable about satisfying their own physical need with masturbation if they need to. And that saves a lot of relationship hassles and discomfort around this subject. Lube. So it doesn't matter how old you are or young you are, you really should use lube. And there's a lot of different lubes to choose from. Um, one of the biggest complaints I see after pelvic treatment or surgery of any description is sensitivity. So you get reduced sensitivity. Using lubricant improves the sensitivity in that area. So it's not just about making everything a bit slippery, slidey and easier. It's also will help improve your sensitivity. So very, very important to use that. There's lots of different ones. Don't use KY jelly. It's awful stuff. It goes all dry and tacky and horrible. But, you know, even like I have lubes on my website, my sex shops have good quality lubes, physios sell them now, and even Coles and Woolies have some really good brands now. So it's just, you've got to go up to the counter with it. So yeah, but anyway, I also use lubricant to run a sail in a mast when I go sailing. So there's other uses apart from this. Um, so you can get water-based gels or creams. Um, water-based is the best to use if you're using sex toys because they don't, um, they don't break down the silicon of the sex toys. You can get silicon lubes, which are excellent. They sort of slide over each other. 
Um, and you can get hybrids, which I think is funny because it's not just cars then. You actually get hybrid ones, which are a mix of water-based and silicon. And you can also get oil-based lubes. And all of them, that depends on who you are, what you like the feel of. And like, I just recommend people to try try them all and figure out what works best for those. The only problem with most oil-based lubes do stain your sheets and that's not great. So, um, yeah, I think probably water-based and silicon ones are better. But the good thing about the oil-based lubes is that they often don't, um, they're really good for people who have like lots of sensitivity. So let's talk about toys. Um, so toy, a sex toy is anything that enhances sex, but how do you know if you've never had one before, which one is right for you? So the little green one at the bottom with that little kind of looks like a mouth on it, that's the airwave toy I was talking about. And I've got one here I can show you. Um, so people often think of sex toys as like a dildo, you know, that you'd see in some movie or in a porn star. These, they are not like that. I mean, you can obviously buy those, but they don't have to be like that. Pop this little hole here over the hub of the clitoris like that. and that it just puffs air and the way you if you ever want to buy a sex toy and you want to try and figure out whether it's any good or not you put it on the end of your nose which is pretty sensitive not as sensitive as your clitoris but pretty sensitive um, and it's a good way to feel what it feels like but these are brilliant and they're particularly good for women who have had any sort of pelvic cancer and treatment because they're gentle they have different things on them but vibration is often really annoying when you've had that sort of treatment and airwave is much gentler, but it's also really great. It's quite feathery. So it's really good if you've got reduced sensitivity. So definitely worth trying one of these. The other one that I recommend and the same, these come in all different brands is this one. This is called an egg. Now the egg has this little bit at the end here, which vibrates. So some people prefer vibration and some people prefer air. Same thing, pop it on your nose and you can try. Now, remember earlier I was telling you that the penis and the clitoris are quite similar. So just as the clitoral hub is, um, nub is really sensitive on the penis. So if you look at Jeffrey here, just under the head of the glands, that's the frenulum. That's usually for most men, the most sensitive part. Uh, and often, so I did see a guy today who pretty much feels numb down there. And I asked him if he'd tried there and he was like, no. So he did, he had a feel and he goes, oh, you're right. The only part left that actually feels really sensitive. So you can use these like vibrators or airwave toys as well on there. The other thing is, is if you've had your prostate removed, um, like you often do with, with bladder cancer, then those prostate cancer, those prostate nerves, if they've saved them, they'll be kind of quite low down on your perineum, which is between if you look at the bottom of your testicles back to your anus, there's that bit of skin that's called your perineum or young people call it a gooch. And one of my patients calls it a chin rest, which I thought was hilarious. Um, so you can get a vibrating thing and put that on there is actually also quite good for men. So I think the problem with sex toys is they get a bit of a bad rap because people think of them as these yucky, tacky, big purple things with buttons all over them they don't have to be like that and I think the other thing is is that men are often feeling like they are taking the place of them and women often often feel worried about suggesting to bringing one into the bedroom particularly if they have a male partner and their male partner has erectile dysfunction and I heard a really good analogy about this from a sexologist in America and I, I thought it was brilliant so I pinched it off her but she said, when a builder builds a house, he uses drills, hammers, screwdrivers, all sorts of tools. He never ever, or she, the builder, doesn't go away and say, hey, I used a great drill today. They finish their job and they say, I built a great house. And I think you have to think of sex toys like that. It's like they enhance what you're doing and help you achieve pleasure and you know increase your sensation and all of those things they're not there it doesn't take away from you being intimate with your partner or close to them or it's just a tool you can't cook dinner without tools so unfortunately sometimes after you've had treatments and things like that you need tools to help things work but as long as you get them to work that's okay 
So what can partners do to help? And I know I've said this a lot of times, but honestly, talking about what's going on and telling each other how you feel is really important. Um, Tell your partner what makes them what makes them special, sexy to you. And so, actually, it was a prostate cancer nurse um, in New Zealand told me that she does this every time she sees a new couple, and I think it's great. She always says to not the person with the prostate cancer that's about to have treatment, but the partner. She says, "What is it about this person that is sexy to you and makes them masculine to you?" And she said, "Not once ever has the partner said." Oh, the fact that he gets an erection and we have sex. It's always that he's caring, that he's kind, that he's brave, that she feels safe or he feels safe with his partner. It's all of those things. And so I think tell your partner what it is about them that is attractive to you because I think they'll often be shocked because a lot of people when they lose their sexual function, whether it's men or women, feel as though they're kind of useless and that they've lost their femininity or masculinity. So I think it's really important that we tell our partners what makes them special to us um, and so that they know that because it's very easy to think they know when they don't. Be vulnerable. Tell them how you feel. Be adventurous. Try new things, but also understand that it's a time of grief. Uh, and I think that's a big thing. I think we all... I think most of most people would understand that if a woman gets diagnosed with breast cancer and has to have a double mastectomy, that she's going to feel a, a bit weird about that and she might feel like she's lost some of her femininity. But I think for men as well, when they lose their sexual function, it's just not as obvious to the world, but they feel the same. And it is a grieving process. It's something that's been with people, things have worked a certain way their whole life and suddenly they're not. And I think we need to acknowledge that as a time of grief and 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 let our partners talk about it and and don't just go, oh, it's okay. It doesn't matter if we never ever are intimate again. I still love you and you're still alive. That's not what your partner wants to hear. And when I hear partners say that to someone who's just been diagnosed and is having a treatment that's going to affect this, I see the 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 partner looks like they they think they're saying the right thing, and the person who's getting the treatment, their face falls. And I think it's because what they hear is, oh, they don't care if we're never intimate again. But it's not that. It's just, it's all about communication. So make sure you communicate well. The other problems that are unique usually to illnesses is that if the partner takes on the role of the carer, there's not often not a longer view of, like, they don't see that person as a sexual being anymore. So, you know, I think, if someone's going to have a long illness, I always recommend that you get someone in to help with like showering or, you know, if you've got a, an ileostomy, like make sure, don't ask your partner to change that. Make sure you do it yourself or you get taught how to do it from a stoma nurse. Because if your partner's putting on the hat of nurse, carer and doing all of these like daily life things for you, then it's very hard to take that hat off and then put on the hat of that you're supposed to be seen as this sexy person that that they want to see as a sexual being. So I think as much as you can, if it's going to be a long-term, if it's a short-term situation, it's fine to get your partner to help out. But if it's going to be a long-term thing, figure out how to do it yourself or get someone else to help you, not your partner, because it's going to be really hard for them to see you as a sexual being. Partners get exhausted. Um, I think Partners are often, you know, where they're so busy worrying about the person who has the illness that no one worries about them and they get exhausted. So try and remember that. Partners often get depressed or they get really anxious because they're worried about the person they love. Um, and they often, the patient is often, often so worried about their own health and trying to just get through their treatments and everything that they emotionally disconnect. So if you're the patient, the person who has the illness, then try and remember that. Remember that the person who loves you is going through as much as you are. These are just some really good books that I think are great. Um, the Five Love Languages, not about sex at all. Um, if anyone has never, if you've never read this book, it's been around for a really long time. I personally think it's probably the best book written about relationships. Um, it's basically in a nutshell 
there's, we all have a love language. They can be, and I always forget one, so bear with me, acts of service. So you feel loved when someone does something for you. Quality time, you feel loved when someone spends one-on-one -on -one quality time with you. Gifts, you feel loved when someone gives you a nice gift. Uh, see, I went, I've forgotten two tonight. Uh, physical touch, obviously, and oh, words of affirmation. So when someone tells you how great you are. The problem is, is that we often show our love and affection for the person, uh, another person, the way we want to receive it. So, for example, if my love language was acts of service, I might think, oh, I know what I'll do. My partner loves having a clean car. So I'll go and clean the car for them because I would love it if someone did that for me and I would feel like they'd really thought about me. But if my partner's love language is quality time and I'm outside cleaning the car for him, instead of saying, hey, how about we go and go for a bike ride together, then he's not going to feel loved at all. He's going to feel like I'm too busy to spend time with him. So think about what the person, not your love language, but about what your partner's love language is and try and fill their cup. And so this book, it's really quick to read, takes about two hours. It's got a quiz at the back. And then if you both do the quiz, then you can read what the other person is. And then it's really often a really great way just to open the conversation. And often everyone will make sure that they're acts of service so someone else does all the housework. No, I'm just joking, not really. It's a good, it is a really good book. So I really encourage everyone to read it. Um, Facing the Tiger is written by an amazing woman called Susan Chambers. Um, it does talk about like the survivorship of prostate cancer men and their intim and a, there's a lot in it about intimacy and relationships. But I think that if you read it, it pretty much pertains to anybody who has had any kind of cancer treatment that affects their their intimate function. So I think it's a really good book. Come as you are is probably the best book I've ever read about women's sexuality. So excellent book this woman did a whole phd on um women and how they feel and what makes them tick and how they feel intimate and i just think it's a great book i've recommended this to lots and lots of couples and the amount of men who have come back and said to me and they're in their 40s 50s 60s i wish i read that when i was 30. so um i think it's a really good book it's an easy read uh, and it's really good and if you listen to books like talking books it's on audible as well um, oh, before I get to that, I was just going to say there is treatments for, and I didn't want to talk too much about that tonight because I've talked about that a lot before, but, you know, for women who have side effects from cancer treatments and they might get vaginal atrophy, dry vagina, you know, pain with sex, all of those things, there's a lot of treatments available now. And there's a lot of treatments that are not hormonal. So if you need to avoid hormone treatments, there's a lot out there. So don't just think, oh, it's there's nothing I can do because there is a lot. So please seek help. And for men and erectile dysfunction, there is so many options that it's not funny. You know, don't think, oh, if tablets don't work, Viagra doesn't work, Cialis doesn't work, it's all over. Um, and I'll just show you briefly, but many men, injections usually work when tablets don't. And I have a lot of patients who have had bladder cancer surgery um, that use injections and they work great. And most men are just like, oh my God, I'm never going to stick a needle in my penis. But I just want to give you a very brief rundown and try and encourage you to give it a go at least once. So if you look at the shaft of the penis, there isn't any like nerves that really experience sensation inside the shaft. So when a needle goes into your penis, it doesn't feel like one that goes into your arm or into your finger. Like I've got diabetic patients who say when they take their blood sugar, blood sugar level, it's way more painful than having an injection into their penis. Um, the way I teach it is with an auto injector. So you just pop it on, you press the button, push, take it out, and 10 minutes later it goes and up he goes. So they work really, really well. They override the problem that you're having with your nerve function that's been created by your treatment. They also work for old age, diabetes, all of those things. There's also penile implants you can have now, which is surgery, and they're really successful. So, yeah, there's a lot of treatments. So, you know, it really depends. I can't go through all the treatments for men and women today, but please don't think that 
it's all over and that there isn't help because there is a lot of help out there and there's a lot of different treatments and it's just about talking to someone and figuring out what's going to work best for them as an individual and them as a couple. Uh, if any of you listen to podcasts, I have a podcast called The Penis Project. Um, I used to do it with a physiotherapist called Jo Milios, but she's doing other things now, so it's just me. But we're up to episode 150. We've been going for three years now, and we interview men about their men's problems. Now, for any women, I'm sorry that doesn't, we don't do women because there's so much information and so many pod, podcasts about women. But when we started this three years ago, there wasn't any that was specifically for guys. So the idea of this is most men don't speak that openly to each other. And so they use a fake name and we talk to them about their penis problem or their sexual problem or their intimacy problem. I have also interviewed um, a gynecologist on there about women's issues just because a lot of our listeners, and we've got over half a million listeners now worldwide, they will uh, they say all the time, I want to know more about women. So I'm starting to get a little bit more about women. But on there, we have lots of different people. We've got guys who have had their prostate out. We've got people that have had bladder cancer, men who have had Peyronie's disease, young men with premature ejaculation. I interviewed a guy recently that was 34 and he had a massive bone cancer in his hip and he had half of his pelvis replaced with titanium. No one told him that his penis wouldn't work again because the pelvic surgery had had stuffed that up for him. And it wasn't until a year after the surgery when nothing worked, he got the courage up to ask his physiotherapist who sent him to come and see me. And, you know, he's 34, he's using injections, he's back on track and he's dating again. So just there's a lot of things that we just never think about that will affect sexual function and there's a lot of things we can do to help. So... If you want to hear other people's stories, please listen to The Penis Project. It's on Apple, Spotify. It's on um, on my website and it's great. And if you've got a story to tell and you want to share it, send me an email because I love interviewing new people. The other thing is seeing it, people often think as they get older, oh, well, I, I have cancer, I've had treatment, and also I'm too old to worry about sex. You're never too old. To worry about that people do continue to enjoy sex as they get older and the other thing I hear all the time is oh I, my wife and I don't have sex anymore because she's been through the menopause women can enjoy sex after menopause so please don't just assume that and it is good for you and it's good for your relationship I love this quote from Woody Allen is sex dirty only if it's done right I did a talk about a month ago and I got a very grumpy message from one of the ladies in the room she said her husband's been telling her this ever since she wasn't very happy about it but um yeah so I, told that. I just love that picture which is why I put it on there I think it's really cute and if a car is sexual function then a great road trip is your sexual well-being so it's not all about the end goal it's about the journey to get there and if you want more information about me that's me so if you wanted to check out my website and they can all see people um, online as well.